I booked a classroom at night, 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. And I went through every single question. I remember coming to a question which in my mind was totally obvious. That would be, I, in fact, as I was thinking, how am I going to explain to my students the answer, I thought, that's just the way it is. There's nothing to explain about it. That's how clear it was in my, in my mind. So I remember making a drawing on the board and then saying, you know, it was comparing two forces in an interaction pair. I remember turning around and saying, by Newton's third law, these two forces are equal. To me, there was nothing more to explain about it. And I had about 100 and, no, I had about 250 students in my class that year. I remember turning around with the drawing behind me, looking at the students and seeing from their faces that they were confused. So, but I could not imagine what was confusing about it. So I said, is there a question? They were so confused they could not articulate a question. They, 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 didn't, they, they couldn't bring it in words. You, you know, when you're conf really confused about something, it's hard to articulate that confusion. So, you know, I thought, well, maybe they're confused with that the forces are the same, but the effect that it's different. So anyway, so I raised the board, I started over, and in the next eight or so minutes, I gave what I thought was the most brilliant explanation possible. So the whole board was covered with drawings and equations and it was all there how you know the forces could be the same but the effects would be different and I turned around you know thinking this is just great you know they looked even more confused and and I had no idea what to do I was standing there thinking you know how can this be and and they, they were asking questions but I didn't even understand what 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 they were asking me right because their vocabulary was different from mine so anyway so so I didn't know what to do but I knew one thing I knew that half the students had actually given the right answer on the test so in a moment of despair I said to them why don't you just discuss it with each other and what happened was amazing complete utter chaos okay I mean Everybody started talking. They forgot about me in front of the classroom. And what was even more surprised was that within two minutes they figured it out. You could actually see the students go talk and then go, oh, oh yeah. And for a moment that surprised me. I thought, how can that be? I, the expert, have tried it in two different ways for about 10 minutes unsuccessfully to explain to them and they just talk for two minutes and they get it but let's imagine that you and I are sitting next to each other we're, we're students right you have the right answer because you understand it and I have the wrong answer because I do not understand it we talk to each other on average you are more likely to convince me than the other way around simply because you have the right way of thinking but that's not the important thing the important thing is this you, as a student, are more likely to convince me as a student because Professor Mazur in front of the class has learned it such a long time ago. To him it's so incredibly clear that Those he doesn't... To be exactly, right? It, it, it's something my, my colleague Steven Pinker calls the curse of knowledge. You, you tend to think that the more of an expert you are, the better positioned you are to teach it. False. The better you know it, the more likely it is that you've forgotten what the struggles are of a beginning learner. Even if you had those struggles yourself way back when. And you know, to some degree we know that. Right? We know that when we go to a colloquium or a seminar in our own discipline and we listen, yes, we can get excited, but then if we're asked to reproduce whatever was said, we can't. We also know that often people who are in age closer to the people who are being taught are more effective at teaching than the older professor. Graduate students who teach the discussion section are often closer to the students and therefore better able to explain it. So why not tap the students themselves? And that's, so that's how the idea of peer instruction was, uh, was, was born, right? So I saw, when I saw that interaction, I thought, 
wow, that's what I should do. Now, in order to, so the cycle, let me describe it. So I come into class, I talk maybe a few minutes, I ask a question, I give them one minute to think about that. I have them vote. First, we simply used hands on the chest, with fingers indicating the choice. After that came the clicker, which was developed as part of my classroom. And then people adopted the clicker without thinking about the pedagogy. <laughs> um, but forget about it, about the technology. Students have to commit to an answer. They could do it on paper. And after they've committed, they have to find a neighbor with a different answer. So I turn to you, ask you what answer did you have? Oh, I had the same answer, so thank you. And I turn to the other neighbor, and I try to find a person around me who has a different answer. We start to argue, and chances are that one of us will go, oh, yes, you're right, and change our, our, uh, our mind. Typically, if initially between 30 and 70% have the desired answer, then after a few minutes of discussion, that 30 to 70% can increase to close to 100%. And there are many students who would have gone, oh, yes. And then, you know, I wrap up with the discussion and I start the next cycle. And then the next cycle. And so on until class time is up. So I came across a technique called just-in-time teaching, which I used for many years. It is essentially, it offers the students a carrot and a stick. It's only really in the last five years that I've been able to nail this problem. Uh, and the way I nailed it is actually so obvious in retrospect. You see, I'd worked hard on making the classroom a social interaction with students talking to each other and helping each other. I never thought about making the out-of-class component social interaction. I mean, again, if you have a student reading a book, it's an isolated, lonely experience, right? You're reading the book alone. What if we could somehow use technology to bring students together? So we developed a, a social learning platform called Perusal. Where we now have agreements with most um, uh, publishers, in fact, I think nearly all publishers that people have requested. And, um, and what happens is that students read the textbook or the notes or whatever the instructor makes available, and if they have a question, they can highlight the part where they have a question and open a chat window and pull other people in. It can use, it's, it's actually linked to social media like Twitter, Facebook, or, or whatever the students happen to use. And, and then the student uses machine learning and artificial intelligence to analyze students' engagement, give feedback to the instructor on the student's engagement on the platform, but also uses um, nudging to get students to participate in this reading. And using that platform, I found that I, for the first time, I can now really design new courses where Provided I have a good text, I can completely eliminate the lecture, completely. Um, but it was, was not easy, even though in retrospect I think it's kind of obvious. Yes, you have to make it social, because learning is a social experience. Messages, such as the message that we've been discussing, at least gets listened to more, and that more people think, hmm, maybe I should be rethinking what I do in the classroom. In that respect, I think edX has done a really good job. I'm not a believer in edX at all. I, don't, I think it does very little, and it has done very little for education. With one exception, people, faculty, whose course is put on edX, suddenly start to think after they've put their course on edX, what's my role? What's my role in the classroom? So I hope that 10 years from now, more people will start asking themselves, more faculty, more instructors, more teachers will ask themselves, what is my role in the classroom? And maybe I should not 
just be lecturing and doing things that are easily available on the internet and, and elsewhere. That's my hope for the future. I, I have a, a talk called Assessment, the Silent Killer of Learning. Uh, because I, after, after implementing peer instruction, I realized, yes, I changed the approach to teaching, but from the student point of view, the really important part is the assessment, the examination, right? And if I really want my students to learn, then I should adjust the assessment so that it promotes learning and is in fact a learning opportunity, not a punishment, which unfortunately most assessment is. I mean, if you, if you ask a student, how do, how do you think about exams? I mean, they see it as a stressful event. And uh, stressful events are not the best way to learn. So I, 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 I think that not only do we need to change our approaches to teaching, we must also change our approaches to assessment. Education is completely focused on the individual. Students come to our universities, your students at the Tech, my students at Harvard, they go to classes. In many classes, they're sitting next to other students, but you know, the classes are not interactive. Well, I think the tech is probably doing better than many other institutions. But certainly in my institution, many, many classes are still lecture-based classes. So yes, they're sitting next to other students, but they're not talking to the other students. So it's alone. They go home, they study alone. They go to an exam. They're separated from each other. They're not allowed to talk to each other. They're not allowed to look up any information. They're not allowed to look anything on the internet or nothing. They just have a pen and a piece of paper. And that's how we examine them. And then we give them a, 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 a grade and a degree and we send them to society. And what happens, they're of course, they're always working together. And they always have access to whatever information they want. So, in a sense, I think the educational model that most universities in the 21st century are still using is simply not in line with the reality of society, which is collaborative and constant um, access to changing information. So, I give my students access to information. They can use the internet. I give students access to each other. They never take an exam alone. Yes, there has to be an individual, uh, an individual responsibility, but everything is in teams. And then the team evaluates how everybody has contributed to the team, so that you know not everybody just gets the the, 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 the team. The, yeah, that right, exactly. But at least students have to learn how to work together and how to use information rather than putting the information in their in their heads and remembering